Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our April meeting. If you would all please join me and start off with the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Agenda. I was particularly excited about our first presentation. <laughs> um, we have a presentation by our Ukulele Club. students in 2019 and we hope to also attend this year. So uh, Uke Fest takes place at the Chopin Music and Dance Center. Um, the Chopin Music and Dance Camps bring professional musicians to the beautiful Chopin Center to share their knowledge with people of all ages. Um, it's not uncommon as we found for there to be like a 40 plus age gap. Uh, we were some of the youngest people there and there are people that were as old as like 80, which was neat to share. Um, Ashoka Founders Jay Younger and Molly Neeson's vision for the camps is to bring people together and create a fun and non-stressful and learning environment where everyone can enjoy making music. As a young adult, I attended a few of the dance camps um, right after college when I was interested in playing fiddle and folk music. Um, I had truly liked changing experiences and met people that I'm still in touch with today and um, it helped renew my love of music after going to college and being a little bit just overwhelmed with it. Um, and when I started teaching, I really wanted to bring students to the Shokin Center because of all the benefits it brought me as a person and musician. Um, in 2019 was the first year that we went, and then we went again last year. Both years we fundraised and then got matching funds from the Burt St. Cora Charitable Trust, as well as um, got some scholarship money from the Shokin Center, and they've offered to give us a pretty big scholarship this year for our students attending too. Um, both years at the camp, students learned a lot and had a really wonderful time. Um, and I'm going to just hand it off to our students to talk a little bit. Go ahead, Rose. So when we were there, we went to a lot of different workshops, some about things like arpeggios and different Hawaiian music, and also some about different types of spirituals. And they really helped, I know me specifically, but they helped everyone become better ukulele players and also better musicians. Um, even though we didn't go as a full group, our small group of four, five, 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 yeah. five ish kids, we made really close connections. When we got there, we had a tent, but we didn't know if there was a hole in it, and decided <laughs> to start pouring at that exact moment, of course. And so we got in, and there was water everywhere. We were just using like electrical tape, which does not work. Don't bring electrical tape. Um, and it was just such such a fun experience. And as a whole group, we bonded so close. Um, the surrounding area was really beautiful and kind of uh, life changing, I guess. And it was at a lake right where we camped and we played cards under this big pavilion, like all to ourselves. And yeah, we just would eat outside, like in the middle of the woods, and we like, hiked to this um, bridge. Yeah, it was a magnificent area. <laughs> I thought it was such a unique experience to bring together people of all ages, whether 15 years old or 75 or 80 years old, for the sole reason of playing ukulele. I thought that was really amazing to bring everyone together for that reason of playing music. And the food there was 
amazing. <laughs> they usually grow a lot of it there, um, and so that's part of their mission as well. We have like farms and stuff like that around as well, and then they have fresh food that they need for everyone. Um, we also got an email from like a camp member that he was last year to ask if we would play with them again, like music for us to get ready, which is cool. And it's like a retired guy, he's like 65. <laughs> Make that connection. Um, all right, that's another cute picture. All right, <laughs> we're going to play a short little thing for you that we did at the Fox concert. Miss Gibson, um, yes. before you start playing, can yes. you just have our students introduce themselves? Oh, I'm so sorry. Or maybe starting with, I was going to say maybe starting with Rose, but then you moved. <laughs> Well, we can start with, she on the end here, um, who, Risen is not attending you guys, but hopes to, so he's here to also help me play a hard part, because I'm not sure. Share your, your name, so, and yeah. know what grade you're in. Risen Reed, 11th grade, and I hope to be best in two years. Um, I'm Rose, and I'm also a junior. I'm Riddle, I'm also a junior. Um, I'm Ellie, I'm also a junior. <laughs> I'm Aaron, and I'm also a junior. <laughs> And we have a lot of other, a couple other members that aren't here tonight. Yeah, so this year we're hoping to send Randall, Ellie, and Aaron. We have conflicts otherwise, but keep it going. All right, we're going to play Sunshine of Your Love, but on ukulele, so it's super rocking. Um, one time through, right? Yeah. Right. Invitational in October. We should have, you should have received itineraries in your packets. 
Uh, our training camp, which we have been doing since 2004, is always a great opportunity to bond as a team, train really intensively, and have a lot of fun. The Paul Short and Manhattan Invitational will give us a chance to race against teams from all across the country in national caliber races on fast courses. In the past few years, the cross country team has been fortunate enough to be able to participate in some great meets, including the Manhattan Invitational, the Paul Short Run, the Six Flags Wild Safari Invitational, the Ocean State Invitational in Rhode Island, the Walt Disney World Invitational in Florida, and the American Cross Country Festival in North Carolina. We've never had any problems on any of these trips, and we really appreciate the board's support of our program over the years. We'd like to be able to continue to attend these high quality meets, aside from being one of the most successful programs at DA, winning 11 sectional championships and one New York State title in the last 10 years. We have also been one of the highest participated sports with about 40 cross country runners signed up for next season. We're asking you to please provide or please approve both trips and for the district to cover the cost of school bus transportation and driver expenses. All costs associated with the trips will be covered by parent contributions, existing funds, and donations to the program, including a $5,000 matching grant we have received from the O'Connor Foundation. We would like to emphasize that no student athlete on our team will not be able to participate due to an inability to pay. Finally, several parents have also already volunteered to accompany us on both trips as chaperones, so supervision is already completely covered. Thank you for, our, for your consideration, and are there any questions? The itineraries, uh, Lisa just clarified, were provided to you digitally, so that that's why there are not hard copies. I have a question. Does every um, member of the track team go to every one of these, or no, it's just a few? Every single one? Yes. Yes. Thank you. I would like to then actually motion please to approve the request from the cross country team to travel to Camp Hilltop, Hancock, New York from August 22nd to the 24th to attend the Paul Short Invitational in Bethlehem, PA on September 29th, and attending Manhattan Inv Invitational Six Flags Great Adventure on October 8th, 7th to the 8th. So, is that a second? Second. Lauren, thank you. Any questions or comments? Good luck. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Congratulations, Tampa. Okay, at this time we'll take public comments. The Board of Education <coughs> believes that open communication with our parents, students, teachers, personnel, and district residents is very important. For this reason, the board set aside time at the beginning and end of each regular meeting for public comments. However, in order to focus on tonight's previously scheduled agenda, as a general rule, the board will not be able to respond to your comments or questions at this time. We may refer your comments and questions to the administration for follow-up, or we may <coughs> excuse me, or we may add the subject of your comments to the agenda of a future meeting. Either way, please be assured that we welcome and take your comments very seriously. The board asks each person to limit comments to not more than two minutes. In order for the district clerk to maintain accurate records of the meeting, each individual is requested to state his or her name and address. Do you have any public comments? Moving right along. <coughs> A motion, please, to approve the minutes of the regular meeting held on March 27th, 2023, as submitted and amended. So, Kim, thank you. And a second? Second. Lucy, thank you. Any questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion is carried.
a motion, please, to approve the personnel recommendations as listed below. Uh, yeah, thank you. A second. Second. Thank you. Any questions or comments? I could hear Mr. Wake saying, it's going to happen this time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll give her. Uh, Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, the motion's carried. A motion, please, to approve the financial reports as submitted by the treasurer for February 28, 2023, as submitted. So moved. Thank you. And a second? Thank you. Any questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion is carried. A motion, please, to accept the special education report from the Director of Special Education for March 31st, 2023, as submitted. So, Lauren, thank you. And a second? Second. And thank you. Any questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion is carried. And we'll move into uh, principal's monthly reports. Good evening, everyone. For student enrollment, elementary, middle school, and high school, there are no enrollment changes. Starting with student successes, elementary school, the New York State ELA assessments have been administered to fifth and fourth grades. Third grade will start tomorrow and complete on Wednesday remember what day it was. Um, the New York State math assessments are scheduled for May 2nd through the 9th. For refusal totals, there's been one third grade student, zero fourth grade students, and seven fifth grade students. Moving on to the middle school, Building Better Futures has their second session with grades six through eight. And the second session includes three sessions within that, and those are scheduled for April 27th. Jennifer Bichon, Colleen Lester, and Kylie Lamoureux are the facilitators, and the sessions are 80 minutes with each grade level. And there's a focus on self-regulation with the goal of self-awareness and the ability to adjust reaction level based on the environment. The future topics include working together to solve a, commu to solve a community. Middle school dance was last Friday. It was very well attended. Not all students enjoyed the chance to socialize and dance with their friends and fellow classmates, shake their group thing as it was announced. On the announcements. The New York State ELA assessments have been administered to grades six and seven. Eighth grade will start tomorrow, concluding on Wednesday, and the New York State math assessments are scheduled for May 2nd through 9th. In the high school, 10 students in grades 10 through 12 attended the final session of the Cassick Caskill Area School Study Council Leadership Conference for the year with one of our student directors. And two juniors were nominated as student directors for next year. And those student directors help organize the events for the other students that attend. The high school senate hosted a blood drive last week. We exceeded our goal collection, so thank you for everybody that came out. And our 10th grade, all of our 10th grade students and interested in 11th grade students attended a college fair at SUNY Delhi on April 12th. I don't want to steal your thunder, Ms. Zimmerman. Are you going to mention the track and field records at all? Keep going. Okay. <laughs> Um, varsity track and field broke three records at the Quinney Invitational at Sydney. At Sydney. Vincent Van Yaren, who was just here, broke a pole vault record, 12 feet. Additionally, Vincent Van Yaren reached the super standard height of 14 feet, which automatically qualifies him for the state meet. That's amazing. Yeah. So the other two records that were broken, Gretel Hilson Schneider, who was also here, uh, set the record in the steeplechase with a time of 7.44.20. And then the 4 by 800 relay team set a record with a time of 8 minutes, 41 se four, 8 minutes, 41 seconds, and 28. And faculty and staff updates for the elementary. 
after, oh, maybe I should wait on this one. I'll go there. Um, after 39 years of dedicated service to the students of Delaware Academy, Mr. John Wake will be retiring. Ms. Mabel writes, John has been a caring, fun, and professional member of the DA family, who will be missed by the students and staff alike. I wish him all the best in his retirement. He has earned it. For middle school, the second session of the de-escalation PD was held on March 30th with Gretchen Jones, who's a behavioral specialist from the Southeast Regional Partnership Center. We had 19 teachers in attendance from all three buildings. On Wednesday, April 26th, from 3 to 4 in the middle school library, Val Sobers from the Southeast Regional Partnership Center will be providing a PD. The focus will be on the present level of educational performance plus within the IEP. And for the high school, Amanda Kane and I attended the SEAL of Civic Readiness Training today in Norwich. Our next steps will be developing a committee and working on planning for our application process to implement that next school year. <coughs> the SEAL allows students an additional pathway to graduation, so it's pretty exciting. The counseling department hosted the 11th grade parent night last Wednesday. We have the 9th and 10th grade parent night coming up this Wednesday, the 8th grade parent night the following Wednesday. And the counseling department partnership with, or has partnered with Career Destinations through DC Mobosis and our Brilliant Pathways program to organize a college and career fair day, and that will be this Thursday. We have over 20 businesses that will be in attendance, plus colleges, military, and other post-graduation options for students to explore. Events coming up in the elementary school, or for the elementary school, April 28th is Young People's Concert down here in the high school auditorium at 1 p.m. It's the third, fourth, and fifth grade attend the concert at 1. In the middle school, the college and career fair, the eighth grade will be attending during period seven. They'll be participating in the Young People's Concert, testing for math, May 9th, or 2nd through the 9th, Nisma Solo Festival in Norwich, May 12th and 13th. The Grade 8 State Science Performance is May 23rd through June 2nd. National Junior Honor Society Induction Ceremony is May 24th at 2 p.m. in the High School Auditorium. And the 26th is the High Note Festival for Middle School Orchestra and Band at Lake George. For the high school events, 9th and 10th grade parent night is Wednesday in the auditorium from 6 to 7. Just another plug. Counselors will be discussing graduation requirements. We also have a representative from BOCES to talk about CTE programming and helping students start thinking about their pathways in the future. AP exams begin next week and run through May 9th. Prom is May 6th at the Bluestone Grill College Golf Course. May 7th is our National Honor Society induction ceremony at 7 p.m. And that is it. Any questions? For the state uh, exams for the elementary, what is the um, percentage of opt-outs? So I don't have the percentage, but I do have the numbers. So one third grade student, zero fourth grade students, and seven fifth grade students. Thank you. How does that affect the district? So there are information for the students that don't take the exams. Remember, a couple months ago, we showed you the data dashboard. Their information isn't able to be included in that. What that, what that ultimately does is it decreases our overall number of students who took them, which makes our student population appear smaller than it is actually, so the lower number of students have sitting for those exams, the, the greater the stakes are in terms of accountability at the state level, because it could lead to a false inflation of performance or underperformance because it decreases our overall number of students. And so those accountability measures, we've been in a district in good standing for a number of years, um, but theoretically it could affect accountability, which in certain levels, um, could drive state aid. Is the young, young people's concert our kids participate in or is something they watch? That is it's a little bit of both. So grades three, four, and five, 
went up to the auditorium and they are the audience. Okay. And then the middle school performs for them and it's really introduction to the different ensembles, chorus, band, um, orchestra, and anybody that's interested to have them sign up. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Schultz. I would like to say something quickly. I did get to the center track today. Got busy, and I never got to the center first on athletic update. But I just wanted to get a brief one. Uh, yeah. No, no, it's fine. Go right ahead. Uh, I was just sitting here with Coach Emilio and talking to her about uh, her track team and some of the young uh, men. Would you mind just coming to the front, just no. for our folks at home? Who are okay. Uh, I was talking to Ms. Emilio about how the merger was going with uh, the track and field team. Um, the first two words that came out of her mouth this evening were fun, funny, and exciting. Um, that the Downsville kids work hard, they're enjoyable to be around, and they really mesh well with the indoor track team. Um, I've got to see our baseball teams compete a few times. Um, the boys seem to be doing really well. I just got off the phone with Burry from Downsville. Um, when I stepped out earlier, uh, he has been interviewing his athletes as to how things are going at Del High and how they're enjoying their time with our athletic teams. And he said overwhelmingly they are uh, loving the opportunity to play and compete with us and they think that the level of competition has been great for their kids. Um, and from my perspective, I can tell you that what I anticipated happening is happening. Kids are playing at an age-appropriate level. Um, I don't see kids being misplaced anymore because we lack a JV team and they're not ready for the varsity competition. I see our kids being successful in playing the speed of the game um, at the level they're at. And, and um, I, I think our teams are being, our teams, our spring sports teams are more successful to this point in the season than they have been in the last few years. Um, I think this, I just wanted to give the board an update on that as we hit about the midway point of our spring season, that I think that's going very, very well. So, any questions, I'll get out of your hair. Thank you. Mr. Schultz. <clears throat> uh, in your folders, there's a packet that has some kind of financial, okay. about four pages of financial information in there. The first one I'll go over is the unit cost methodology. So there's two resolutions within the um, board agenda tonight. One of them, approving the BOCES unit cost methodology. That's basically just a rundown on how BOCES does their billing. So some of it may be percentage-wise, some of it may be per FTE, which is full-time equivalent, full-time equivalent, or WADA. This is what you're voting on. It's just OC sets it up based upon the coaster, which is just an agreement between other districts and BOCES, but I just wanted to provide that to you, okay? The second one is transportation for BOCES. So you're approving transportation contracts for BOCES as basically if we need it. Uh, I've been here almost eight years. We've never used BOCES for transportation. But BOCES likes to do it with all their component districts in case there's an issue and they have to provide some kind of transportation for each district. What has to happen with that transportation, it has to go to SCD for approval. So they'd rather have everyone do it at once. You use it, that's fine. If you, you get aid on it if you do happen to use it. If you don't use it, it's not a big deal. But they like to do everything at once so it's with SCD on a timely, in a timely manner. Because if you do utilize it, you have to have it within 120 days, or 80 days, I'm sorry, uh, after doing it. And if you don't get it in that time, proper signatures, everything else, you don't get any aid on it. So they just kind of push everyone to do it at once. That's why you have those two things in there. So the other two items were request, um, one at a meeting, two different meetings, one at a board meeting. This is the, this is the reserve summary. We talk about uh, reserves that the district holds currently. Reserves are basically savings accounts for districts to utilize. Uh, they're used in different manners. Uh, we currently have about eight of them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I want to make sure I got them all right. Uh, 
We have a workers' comp, which is any kind of workers' comp claim that we don't foresee happening. We can utilize money out of that. Unemployment reserve, same thing. If you get a in high increase in unemployment claims, you can utilize the reserve for that purpose. Retirement contribution, same thing. You see large increases in TRS or ERS. The district can utilize funds out of that. We have a repair reserve that we started a few years ago. TRS reserve at the same time. Liability reserve is basically what it says. So if you have a liability against or a claim against the district, you can utilize funds out of that. We have what's called employee benefit reserve, or they call it EBLAR, which is so as people retire, they have accumulated sick time, and they get retirement incentives based upon that. So you can utilize money out of here to offset those costs. And then we have the debt reserve, or debt service reserve. And that's what we talk about with our capital project. So. I'm not making any assumptions going forward. I mean, I'm not including any of the interest earned that we have this year currently. Uh, I am including the fact that when we get to June of this year, we are going to have to take money out of that debt service reserve to help offset the bond that we just finished on this last project. And I am kind of assuming that we will be funding out of any of the reserves in here. That's the one that you would continue to reserve or continue to add money to. Uh, only because these are the other reserves are pretty well funded, and you start getting the liability reserves. You don't want to fund them over. You don't want to be overzealous about it. Let's just say that you don't want to sit there and stuff three million dollars and you don't have any liability against the district. So just be conservative with these. I would say the debt service is the one that we have consistently funded year after year. Yeah. So, and the budget vote in May is it? Called the capital reserve. Yes. So, so yep. So we're going to start a cap. We're looking to start a capital reserve. Is that going to replace the debt? No. 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 It'll be an additional. We'll be up to nine at that point. So that capital reserve will be strictly for technology. I think we listed it as steam. That's in the proper on the, on the ballot. So it'll just strictly be for those purposes only. No, it won't replace that at all. These are all available through New York State and New York State law. Uh, capital equipment reserve is probably the newest of all the reserves that are allowable in New York State. Um, and as Mr. Schultz had mentioned, the advantage of establishing that is because that will allow us to legally set aside funds to apply to equipment, machinery, those types of things that support steam instruction that, that are not able to So while some people sometimes will put those into a project if you're proposing to update that area, um, you can't get aid on that part of your project, whereas if you include that in a reserve, then those funds are sitting there for you to, to um, access for the purchase of those equipment. So we're looking to establish that uh, this year, knowing two things. Number one, that the Technology Innovation uh, Ad uh, Center is one of the proposed items in the next capital project. However, uh, regardless of where that ends up, you can still use the money in that reserve to update uh, machinery in those areas so as needed. It's not necessarily tied to a capital project. I mentioned this to Carrie um, at our last meeting. I don't, maybe this is just my brain overthinking, but do you think when people go to vote in May, if they see a uh, a line that they have to vote for that says anything with capital, <laughs> that they're going to get confused and think, if I vote here, I'm voting for the capital project or not, or no? Because it's not really we, we anticipated that. Okay. So in the budget newsletter that we just sent to the printers today, actually, there is ex explanation of each proposition that will appear on the ballot in addition to the budget. And where we are hopeful that the word equipment is what will set that aside. It's called a capital equipment oh, reserve. Sorry. And there's there's actual the language as it will appear on the ballot. And then underneath it says, what does this mean? Okay. And there's an explanation of what that is for. Which and is, and would, there, would anything like that be there? Or would any, like, for people that come that night that didn't read this or don't get this, I don't know, would there any be any explanation? Like, this is, when you go to go, I don't know, just. We will have copies of the newsletter there. Um, Mr. Schultz and I always sit and staff the entire row, so if there are questions, uh, we just cannot tell people how to right. vote, okay. or we can educate them on any questions. I just don't want to have on the line. I see that word. 
that sure, you know, if they think that they think that that's, oh, I'm putting on that now. You know what I mean? I, Okay. So, so I brought your concern. concern. <laughs> the question of last week. It was. And so I brought the concern actually to finance committee yes. on Thursday. So we did that okay. kind of prompted that whole discussion in, in I think in the you know in the new in the newsletter it's got that kind of broken out. I agree. Yeah. It's gonna have I mean, so I called Crossstar Three, talked with uh, Dr. Bruce about it actually yeah. that day too. And just kind of said, listen, we can change the wording a little bit. We gotta keep it as capital, but putting that capital equipment reserve in there. And having a little bit more detail, I think, will help out too. All right. So, good point, though. I've got a couple of questions. So, what, um, what the, why the TRS reserve and retirement contribution reserve? We just separated them out. We had one originally as a retirement reserve, and I didn't want it. So then the state about three years ago said, hey, you can do a TRS reserve now too. So we decided to start that one also. Yeah, so instead of combining the two, we just started one separate. Yeah. And what, um, is this, is this COVID related by the amount jumped so much? And 18, 19, 19, 20? No, well, no, it's COVID. Was, we just had extra funds, we decided to fund that, that's all. It was just a board decision at that point. All the, the, the funding is always approved by the board. So we sit back, we have extra money, we come back to the board and say, listen, this is where we'd like to put the extra money into these reserves, which are legal. The board then makes that decision. And we can consider future anticipated retirements and just having an eye on the different trends that we see coming through the district. Um, you know, there are a number of different factors that go into how we advise the board on how to fund each of these reserves. It gives us more, I guess it just gives us more when I started, it was like you had six reserves. You know, they started adding these little reserves here and there. Because if you get into situations, TRS specifically, the market starts to go really south. A couple, you know, a year or so, it's going to take eighteen. It usually takes about eighteen months for it to catch up. And so you could have a year, and it happened in two thousand and eight, where TRS jumped to eighteen percent. You know, we were used to paying nine. So districts got slammed at the same time with ERS and layoffs and cuts in aid. So having these reserves kind of helps offset that budget if you need it. So the last thing I had too was as far as in this pack, it was a AL Kellogg subfund snapshot. They were, I was asked to provide the breakdown of the four subfunds within the AL Kellogg fund. There's also a smaller one here, and within the memorial, there's the AL. Kellogg Memorial Committee, it's a very small amount, but that's included in here. So that's just a breakdown of all the sub funds. I was also requested uh, what the fees were. I pulled the last three years of fees. I did not, I'm not including this year. At, at, actually, I am including this year. I'm projecting this year's. Well, we were at about 100,000 at the end of March. So April, May, June, about three months, probably about 130,000 is what you're looking at for fees. But we've run between 143 and 150,000. Uh, each year for current oversight of the Kellogg Memorial. And then the last thing was that uh, request was a principal that's with, been withdrawn. I did not include this year, and that should say 2020, 2021. Um, 340,000, and then 21, 22, we pulled 328,000 from there. This year, the principal is going to be much less. I think we're looking at about 100. And that was in the budget last year. And all, all the withdrawals are coming out of the capital? We have, that's just principal. The request was for principal only. We've had, we have had interest that's come out also. Sometimes we tap it, sometimes we don't, depending on how we have to offset the budget. Uh, last two. This, this is just, wait a minute. You said this is just interest? I'm sorry. Prin this is principal withdrawal. Principal, yep. And it, it came out of the capital. Yep. So is there a way, way to, to, how do we go about so that gets replenished just by not touching it basically? So what happens with that is you have interest and dividends that gain on that every year. So you're taking a portion out each year. So each, all four of those accounts are interest and dividend bearing. Right. So you would just, you know, you're going to look at it like right now you've got a, Right now, you can take up to 10% of the principal of the capital, which is 250000 We only budgeted 100 So you would either not take as much, or you would turn around and just let it build up as far as the market, the market has gained. That's all. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
And that's the only one we can pull principal out of. Yes. Last two things, uh, front steps repair, which will happen right after graduation. We had a team here Wednesday, I think it was, uh, looking at different styles of stone and brick. One of the things they did was they pulled the a couple treads off. I wasn't out there when they did it, but uh, to look at the foundation. The big question again is if the found, you know, it's all kind of pushing and shifting a little bit. They were afraid that the entire foundation may be completely compromised. Pulled a couple treads off, took a peek in there, and they don't think it is. They think it's just something, you know, a minor shift and that they can fix. So we're getting figures back on that. You know, we originally said the hard construction costs were 399000 almost 400000 to the nose. So they're going to get back to us as far as what the savings was. We were trying to remember the other day when we had a conversation with them about what the savings was. I would say it's between probably one hundred fifty to 200000 they don't have to take that foundation out at all. And, and they can just kind of re, yeah. re brace it and stuff like that. So we'll let you know as far as the more we hear about that. Like I said, that's going to happen right after graduation. And depending on the severity of it, shouldn't take. If it's not the foundation in there that needs to be replaced, I don't see it being more than a month. Um, and then working with Chris, she uh, was notified last week that from Child Nutrition, am I correct? Was Child Nutrition who sent the email? Mm -hmm. Uh, free and reduced. We've had this conversation multiple times about the initiative to go full free meals for students. Uh, we sat in a conference call Thursday, I think it was Thursday, and uh, she's taking care of the information. We basically got to pull data, send off to child nutrition. We're above, it's a 40% mark now that you have to hit. We're 46. 46 and then 42. So one of the concerns was middle school may not be up to that number, but middle school, high school is under one building as far as Betts code, and so we were able to take that. There was a discussion we had with the representative that was, uh, it was a conference call, and my concern was, and I had talked about this in the finance committee, was, all right, if it's all free, sometimes you see the general fund having to subsidize the difference in aid that you would get. And they were actually much more positive and much more reassuring, saying, once you go to a free reduce or free entire building lunch status, you basically, the reimbursement is more, participation is more. So actually you get more money. So it could be close to a wash. So, you know, anticipating forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 subsidy, they're saying no. They, they see very little bit of movement between general, and the general fund would have to pay for it. A little bit of money, there's very little money that's moved from the general fund to subsidize the cafeteria when they when you move to that kind of platform. So just to clarify, this is we're we're qualifying for this for the state, or we decided to do this. No, the state actually reached out to us. It was always a sixty percent mark. There's also an initiative both at the state level and the federal government. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm just going to jump in because I think what you're asking we is, talked about. It, yeah, so we didn't the, follow it, the Correct. In the White House budget right now, there um, there is overwhelming evidence to suggest that the government is going to pick this up as part of the legislative agenda. Because I didn't think that, didn't, the, didn't the governor not put that? But in if it does history? not, and they're I, still out, they've no, extended, still out they've extended okay. it again. Okay. Um, if it does not, what Mr. Schultz is referring to is a way that potentially makes it look more feasible for us to make a decision as a board and as a district to provide free lunch to everybody unilaterally um, with minimal to perhaps no impact to our general fund to offset that, which is not what our initial calculations mm -hmm. indicated. So it was, I know Chris Miller, thank you, Chris Miller. She's been working really hard to advocate on our behalf. I was going to ask if you've got to be super excited Chris, about anything this. to add no. from the call? Yeah, please. And here is a mom. <laughs> <laughs> You're never just a mom. A Boy Scout America. <laughs> um, a lot of our surrounding schools qualify. It's called Community Eligibility Provision, which is CEP. And a lot of our schools have qualified because they're considered like low-income districts. And we were not. We never met that threshold. <coughs> you know, we were always hovering right around that 40%, 60 And then we got a letter that says, you do qualify. Please take a look at this. And Carrie and I had a conversation. And, and we do. I, right now, we're like 42 in one building, 46 in the other. And when Carrie and I met with them, it was, I told the representative, I said, this is too easy. <laughs> you know. 
So I really think we have a good chance. As Carrie mentioned, it increased our participation. It's huge. And yeah. I said that's right where we were during COVID. Yeah. I mean, yes. our breakfast numbers in elementary were doubled. You know, we were getting a lot of participation at the kiosk, and we were seeing a lot in our lunches. And <coughs> I just can't say enough about participation. And we got more money um, from state federal reimbursement during COVID too. And they were showing us again that there's more money there for our reimbursement. So to me, it's like a win-win, and I get to feed more kids. <laughs> <laughs> so I tell you, we got done with the conversation, and, and Chris was her concern was. What are we going to do about elementary with all the kids that end up going to the line? I was like, that's a really good concern. We'll that, so. so that's a good problem to have. That's a great that's problem right. to have. Yes. So. Yeah. So we'll keep you posted on Awesome. Thank you so much. That's, true. that's all I have. Any questions? Thank you. Yeah, uh, just a few things. So you heard Mr. Ferrara speak a little bit about uh, the, the successes from the student perspective on the um, spring pilot merger uh, with Downsville. I've been fielding a number of calls related to concerns, uh, particularly from a few parents in our community related to that. Um, insofar is that uh, it has caused me to do some additional investigation. Concerns were that um, one of them uh, was that students were having practices and games in Downsville to a greater degree than what we had communicated initially and anticipated. Um, and that's for a variety of reasons, but in no way does it diminish uh, the validity of some of the parent concerns and conversations that I've been receiving. Um, so at this point, we have been having preliminary conversations, and we do have a request from Downsville to engage in a potential another pilot merger. And I say pilot because it's the first time going through this with particular sports. We're not at a point where we're looking at long term. Um, this is not a full merger. Uh, there's a lot of chatter on social media outlets uh, and a lot of misinformation at this point being spread. Um, it is not a full merger. We are not uh, at a point where we're talking about changing names, changing uniforms, those types of things. Still pilots. So yes, we're in conversations for a pilot for fall. Uh, however, before we engage in that, we have scheduled a spring merger feedback conversation with the superintendent to take place on Tuesday, May 2nd from 5 to 6 p.m. in the high school library. The intention for that meeting is to review both the successes and the challenges that we faced this past spring to learn from that to best position us as we move forward in our decision making and so that the board can make informed decisions regarding a potential fall merger which will appear on the May uh, board agenda uh, for approval. So this is open to any Delaware Academy student athletes, parents, guardians, and coaches. Um, to just come and share your experiences, um, both positive and negative, so that we can move forward to make um, some factual decisions. I have asked Mr. Ferrara to take some time to quantify the number of practices and games uh, that were actually played in Downsville versus Delaware Academy, because that's been one of the resounding, resounding concerns um, that I've heard. So we will be having an opportunity to discuss that again with our Delaware Academy athletes, parents, guardians, and coaches. Um, I don't know if Downsville is doing the same um, or not. I believe that they are putting out you know, separate in their own communications. So I just wanted to make you aware of that. Um, Can I ask one quick question about that? Of course. Did they, did they say um, particularly what is their concern that it's in Downsville? Don't we transport them there? And <coughs> Or we don't? Well, it's when we sent out the meeting, um, I'm sorry, when we sent out the letter on February 28th, after uh, the board approved the spring sports merger at our February 27th meeting, we specifically said in here that all practices would take place at Del High after school and Downsville would do primary uh, transportation for the students to Del High. Coaching staff from both schools would be participating. While the majority of games are currently planned to take place in Delphi, a smaller number will be played on the Downsville fields. 
But as it turned out, once we got to scheduling um, with consideration for added teams, because we added back in JV, as Mr. Farrar had mentioned, um, and early in the season, the condition uh, of both the weather and of the fields, rather than cancel games, they made some unilateral decisions to play them at Downsville. Um, also, it allowed for when we had a home game um, at the Legion for baseball, it allowed our JV team to get in a full two-hour practice on fields in Downsville. But um, I did not know the degree to which our students were going there outside of what we had put in this initial letter. So the concerns I'm getting primarily are, is, look, you told us this, but this is the reality of what's been happening. Um, so I've been spending the past few days just trying to quantify and understand the degree to which that is happening because I understand that concern. Um, there have also been concerns regarding communication, timely communication of changes in venue, changes in location for practices. Uh, in some cases, parents noting that they're hearing it first from their, from their children. Um, and not realizing that there was a last minute change to hold a practice in Downsville versus Delhi. So they're all legitimate concerns. I'm just working to quantify them so that we can, um, again, make those informed decisions moving forward and provide an opportunity for those most directly affected uh, to come and give us feedback. So again, that would be Tuesday, May 2nd. Um, on, did you say high school library? Did you say high school library? High, this, yep, right here. Yep, in the high school library. Um, I attached this as well. This is just a reminder. This was attached to one of my prior updates. I believe this is also in your folders. Um, we've been identified by the New York State Rural Schools Association to host one of their statewide rural issues forums. Um, it's 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 an honor, really, to have been identified to host this. Uh, this is the um, executive director from the New York State Rural Schools Association is traveling across the state to locations and venues to discuss uh, all items of legislative advocacy as it pertains to rural schools. And so he usually, uh, David Little, will start with an open dialogue, just talking about, kind of he reads the tea leaves a bit, about information that will affect not just our schools, but our greater communities that support them. So this is really a, kind of a public session that's open to any school and community leaders and stakeholders on Thursday, May 11th at 6 p.m. Uh, we are excited to host this event. Following a, a description of, of what's going on, kind of the legislative level, the floor is open for anyone to ask questions and share their thoughts and concerns from an advocacy perspective. Ultimately, all the information gleaned from the series of meetings will be brought together to present a policy brief, which will also serve as, as a platform for advocacy initiatives to be presented uh, by the Rural Schools Association at the state and national level. Uh, so anyone who's interested in attending, again, it is open. Information can be found on our website. Um, and there's also registration information um, on that. Speaking of the New York State Rural Schools Association, um, and information came out today to um, members on their board of directors, so I kind of got the early bird uh, peak uh, for registration for their annual summer conference. Students from our FFA are going to be highlighted at this conference this summer uh, as they're going to uh, have a demonstration booth on our maple syrup production, similar to what they did at the New York State Rural um, School Boards Association uh, this past year in Syracuse. Where's that one held? Um, and this is in Cooperstown. Oh, nice. This is in Cooperstown. Last year, Tammy and I attended, Lucy has attended uh, this conference in the past. So, if there are board members interested in attending, um, just let Tammy know, and um, we can get you registered for that uh, to attend with us. It is July 9th through the 11th, and that is at the Otisaga in Cooperstown. We'll need to know sooner rather than later. Um, the rooms go fast. Spots fill fast, rooms fill fast. <coughs> there also is an option this year 
for um, there's a separate board member registration that you can choose a single day or three day registration. So if you just want to pop in uh, to the conference for a day uh, and pop back out, that's also an option this year that hasn't been in the past. So you can contact um, Tammy if you're interested, might be interested in attending, um, and then she'll work with Lisa on registration. Now, I did see um, Ellie Terrence did well at a, a speaking on behalf of the FSA, and at what level is she, and do we have the opportunity or the the hope that she might be one of the ones presenting at this conference? She, well, I've talked to her about that. Um, and even though she will be graduating in June, she can still be active and she is planning on, on going to this to the rural schools. Um, but with regards to what you're referring to, she's advancing to the state competition uh, in recognition, which is being held May 18th through the 20th at the state FFA conference in Buffalo. Chris, does that sound like Gus? Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, that's right. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Tyler, yeah, you're aware? Yeah, those things are right. Okay. So, could she end up being someone that is it, I mean, that's who they have speak? Oh, all right. So yes, I know what you're talking about now. Sorry. Um, I'm not sure if that was the same competition or not. Uh, but typically, I'm going to look at Miller's again to help me out with this. Um, each year at the New York State World Schools Association, they highlight the, the state winner for two oratorical competitions. Um, is, does that result from the same competition that Ellie has been participating in? They they kind of go up in levels. They have the expository. Like sectionals, and then they have districts, and then they have states. So right. I'm not sure if one is before states or if I can find out if that's the same. That's no, I was just thing. curious. I yeah, yeah. that would be she pretty had, neat. Yeah. Some good success thus far. Right. Yeah. And that's always a highlight of the event is listening to the students give their presentations. Absolutely. Uh, last thing. This should also be in your packets. The, I had sent you on in my update on Friday an invitation. Um, our board members have all been invited to the Athletic Awards night. The date has was changed today. So you have an updated invitation uh, regarding the date there. Uh, that's all I have. Any questions for Kelly? <clears throat> when is the date for the athletic? That is going to be on Monday, June 12th, starting at 5 p.m. Move into board committee reports. <laughs> Athletic committee. I'm trying to think. Just talk about the merger. Yes. Yeah. That was it. And that's going to cover all the information from that. Yeah, that was it because it was one of those as needed mm -hmm, mm -hmm. meetings. Uh, capital project committee. <laughs> um, we met, it was, um, it was, it was kind of a hard one to really get out there so you understand. Uh, Jared Yant, Yant Gondo Yant was there. He spent about a half hour talking to us about how a project's gonna, how a project would work moving forward. Um, very, a lot of information. Um, Gary spent a lot of time asking or answering. Gary and Kelly might a lot of questions I had. Um, um, debt coming on, debt coming off. Um, so we worked through a lot of that. And then we talked about, um, Kelly was, has been talking about doing a walk around, um, looking at sidewalks, looking at other potential problems that need to be addressed when we finally get the whole project wrapped up and, and 
better for people to look at. <laughs> okay. Finance committee. Um, I can just walk down through the agenda here. Sure. We used. Um, so uh, I think it was mentioned earlier that the front step project looks like it'll come in less than what um, originally was projected. We went through the detail on that, so that uh, that truly does save. 200,000, that's huge uh, for us. Um, and that work will be started after graduation and then uh, completed in August. Um, we went through some detail on the incidental budget for the project, and it looks like some healthy projections in there, but we're likely to come down um, at least by 100,000, I think, right? Carrie, where are you? Where's Carrie? Yes. Okay. Yeah, you were thinking about a hundred thousand less probably for the incidental. Yeah, yeah, we originally budgeted about one point nine change, and I think we're going to be one hundred thousand less. So anyway, that's conservative, and I think a uh, good place to be. Kellogg had a good month, back up to fifteen point nine. Um, that was a nice game there. We talked about uh, Legion Fields and a number of some options for the minor repairs that they need. Um, the language around the capital reserve um, resolution that uh, was talked about earlier. And then we talked a little bit about the cafeteria uh, free and reduced um, topic that Chris covered and Carrie covered earlier. And then we are lucky enough to be in receipt of a, an estate um, a bequest that's worth about $60,000 $60, for um, for students, um, for the B plus or higher, with special needs, I think, was that with no, some kind of no, it needs? was, um, yeah, it was more economically disadvantaged. Oh, those, so, those, needs. those right. needs. Okay. yes, all right. Um, and uh, so there's some options, I think there's, I think there's some flexibility in that, that could be used um, as a graduation board. We talked about so more, more discussion on that, but it's nice, uh, nice request. Thank you. Uh, policy committee. Could you find Yeah, we just took a look at uh, working at a policy about surplus equipment and how uh, and, and what to do with it. So we're just in the early stages of changing the language of the old policy into a new one. We're going to work on it next time in policy and then bring it to the rest of you. And that leads us into our policy review and adoption, and we have none this month. <coughs> we'll move into old business and have a discussion on plans for the capital project feedback with no action to be taken. All right, so since we met for our public forum, um, I'm sure, I know I have been, as I'm sure many of you have probably been in receipt of, of phone calls, emails, uh, et cetera, from community members. Anything that I've received, I've turned key directly to all of you, including my response. Um, my response to everybody has, um, has basically thanked them for their input and for their email and that the board will listen to all thoughts and, and comments as they come in um, on this matter. So everything that I've seen, um, you've had uh, in your email. Included in, the, uh, in my update this past week, uh, following that I went back to our um, engineers, our construction managers regarding the overall timeline and schedule. You've heard me say this a hundred times, how important it is that we stick to that particular timeline because there are implications um, for long-term debt if we're able to finance this and continued projects uh, with no additional impact for our taxpayers. So the updated uh, schedule reflects um, an, an approval of the scope at the board meeting on May 22nd. That's not the same as approving 
uh, what way this will appear on the ballot. Um, that seems to be the, the greatest amount of feedback uh, that I've been hearing. It's the greatest amount of advocacy on both sides of the issue. Um, and what I'm referring to is on the proposition, if the entire project goes as one proposition or if it appears as separate propositions for the work related to the athletic fields and then the rest of the project. I cringe a little bit when I say the rest of the project because I feel that in a lot of these conversations, um, some of the hallmark characteristics of this project as a whole are getting lost um, you know, at the expense of, of the advocacy, if you will, uh, surrounding both sides of the athletic issue. So that being said, I still would encourage the board to move toward an approval of the scope um, in order to stay on this timeline because then what that will prompt, as I wrote to you, is our ability to move forward on the, um, on the seeker, which is the uh, environmental quality um, uh, act that the state moves into a review uh, it also starts moving forward, packages sent to SED, packages sent to council, and those types of things, which can all occur before the board has decides how things will appear on the ballot. It doesn't mean that once the scope is approved that we stop seeking input from the community either. Um, but I wanted to provide space because I know that many of you have probably been in receipt of commentary outside of what I've turned keyed in our emails. Um, and just to hear kind of your response and thoughts on what I shared with you in my update, which was this um, schedule to keep us on, on target for that October 10th uh, vote date, or act somewhere in October. I think that seems like a reasonable plan. I think that it provides enough time for an element to Review, revise, come back with thoughts and suggestions. I think that seems fair. Now on May 22nd. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, think it's I think your point about the schedule is is really good. Sorry to continue to interrupt you. No, 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 it's just okay. I um I think we learned our lesson last time that um, the longer if you delay things that you could, you could have decided earlier. It tends to um, impact cost projections. Bid timing is essential. Um, contractor availability, all those things have to line up in the project. And if you get off, you can easily compound and you can get several months off, which affects downstream pricing. And uh, you know, we learned that. So I think it's, it's important we look at a schedule and hold ourselves to making the right decisions at the right time on. And I think it's important for us to continue to have conversations with the community because I'm finding that many people are expressing that um, they didn't realize a lot of what we were sharing with them and, and the information that they had. So the education piece of it I think is critical. Yeah, I, I agree with the timeline. Okay. That's great. This is also an opportunity to share, you know, like if you have been having conversations within the community, information that you think it's important for the board to share, because these are things that we need to continue to keep in public session. As, uh, as we're moving forward with the project. Well, I shared with the, the board privately, um, so I will now share with it openly. Um, I heard less of anti-turf. Uh, um, I heard more of not solving the long-range problem of athletic fields. Uh, and still use of uh, legion fields. Um, I did, uh, and like I mentioned to the board, when people talked about not having the field, I always said, how would you solve the problem? What would you uh, suggest? And 
their suggestion was a, a, a very large uh, proposition that would be a, a 5, 10, 15, 20 a year project mm -hmm. um, where we developed the land that we own behind this elementary school up to Meekers Road. Um, um, some, some one of the people who talked to me said it would be a legacy not for us but for future generations. Uh, it would give us multi fields um, and it would be on our property and we would have control. Um, everyone I spoke to loved the technology part of the building project. They thought that they were excited about it. Uh, and the only concern was they did not want it to go down because of maybe opposition to the fields, and which I didn't want to go have it go down that way either. Um, they didn't object to the cost of the fields, just the fact that the cost was not solving the problem of the long term. And, uh, and that's my feedback from what people say. That's important. Thank what, you. I have a question. With the cost of developing the hill and the mountainside behind the school be like astronomical? Eight to ten million dollars, but it would be a lot. This is a, per, a person who was checked. Um, Where did that number come from? Is that a curiosity? Well, this, I, the person I, I respect, and I don't want to mention his or her name because I didn't ask or, uh, if I could, um, but they said it was some person who knew. I don't know. Uh, that would be something to look into. Are they a, someone who does fields? And Say it a little louder, please. I'm just trying to, I mean, I think one of the issues we have is that now that's going to be, it's going to cost us eight or ten million dollars and we don't have cost estimates on that. No. You see what I'm saying? I, I, I just want to make sure that we, if that is someone that has done a cost estimate, that's one thing, but just to put it a number out there, it's now. Well, I, I just put the number out because Lauren said so. Yeah. so that, well, no, I get, I get you. Just, but I think it's just important. No, it's not. It wasn't oh part no, of number we uh, it's not not based on any estimate uh, that somebody said here it is. I offer you this to do it eight to ten, but it was I thought it was somebody who probably had a background. Uh, excavating. That, that might be to, to me. That might be an excavating cost. I can't imagine that includes the fields, but maybe uh, it wouldn't be <laughs> just to do the uh, to do the fields. This is just to clear the fields, to level the fields for the area, to level it, and then it's just the excavation. build upon that. So I I think the overall point is like I communicated in my opening statement is we're, we need to keep an eye on the long game. What is our long-term plan? I know James has brought up a number of times, it doesn't solve baseball. It still doesn't completely divorce us from the Legion, this current plan. Um, but to your point, if we're keeping an eye on the long game, what could be some options, not in this project necessarily, no, absolutely not. but with considerations for this one, we take baby steps, and then future projects. Could we move 20, 25 years from now landing in a place where we have solved the long-term overall problem or challenge, if you will. So I appreciate that long-term perspective. I'm not hearing you say that we scrap this project and do that now. It would not be feasible anyways. Um, what, what we will run into with those considerations is Typically, our projects every five to 10 years in order to stay at 0% impact our taxpayers are ranging around 8 million. Project, part of projects, you have to have a certain percentage of your project be occurring within school buildings. It can't all be site work. So that, that's one piece. So even theoretically, let's say 10% of that $8 million was dedicated to something in the building. It still doesn't take into consideration the incidentals, as we've talked about, that anytime you do site work attached to a particular building, the state imposes a limitation on the, what they call incidentals, related to how much site work you're allowed to do um, in any given project. So 
every time you do any a touch, any site work in any project, the emergency project that we're doing on the stairs, the project we just closed out, the project we're moving into, site work being anything exterior to the buildings. So anything on athletic fields, paving, um, those types of things. It eats into that allowable incidental cap that the state provides. That's what, in one of our presentations, Carrie and I were illustrating that that falls off and resets every six years? Five, okay. Um, and so every five years, we might see a little increase in that until we hit that total reset. So we have to pay attention to where that is falling off. The next major chunk of that won't fall off until 2030. So while we can think about long-term viability to do all of that in one project will be limited because of what's allowable through the state. So you're um, saying we have to take steps. Absolutely. What you're yes, we have to take we have to take steps. But to have a long-term plan that spans the next 20 years or so, I fully support that. Um, but um, to solve all of the problems in one project is, is not feasible. Um, but I think it's worth considering so that we know factually how much we can afford to do theoretically if that's something we want to prioritize long term. I've had some, several phone calls. <coughs> Excuse me, my voice is scratchy. Um, and similar in sentiment to what Lucy expressed, uh, people are, I got the impression, interested in finding a solution if there's really truly a problem, identifying that, and, and, and you know, if it's that there's work that needs to be done at the Legion, how do we figure it out as a community how to get that done? Not necessarily in this room or this board, but as a community. Um, if it's developing land here that we have, how do we plan that out and, and, and get a real cost and, and, and make it happen? If it's, I've heard other, you know, if could we do a land swap with another, you know, with a village or some other asset next to us that has land that's more readily developable. Um, just exploring alternatives, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, other than that, um, you know, I'm still hearing the concerns about the health safety issues with the turf um, and the um, and uh, you know it, it, some people are have changed their tune on, on, on that issue, but um, still hearing some many concerns about it. And like Kelly said, um, I think people would like to see it as separate referendums, separate propositions. Um, that was consistent throughout the feedback that I got. Else? Um, if okay, so we're looking at May twenty second uh, to approve a scope of work. Are we going with what's been presented as the scope of work? Are we going to have a, a meeting prior? So this is. We're working on another meeting. Right? We could certainly have something. another meeting prior to that. We could schedule a special meeting if that's. Mm -hmm. Something that you guys feel is necessary. But I'm just curious if the. That's up to you to the, decide and to direct. Was, that, just, that's my understanding. That was my understanding. That what's been presented is the scope. Yeah. We just set a date to vote on this, so I thought that that made sense to me. That's what my. I thought that's what was happening. And I would say most of the feedback I've had is pretty much verbatim what Lucy and Shauna just said that everybody doesn't understand why it just can't be two, two line items. 
very concerned that the tech will pass about the whole thing. Just that's what I heard. I had a, a lot of people reach out to me and support um, people that you know, didn't support last <coughs> time are supporting it now. Um, I'm hearing, just to some yeah, and I'm hearing an equal amount of people wanting to vote as one, and then I'm hearing people want it separate. Even people that some people that support the fields are saying that they still would like it separate um, because they're nervous. But um, overall, the I mean, I've spoken, I sent an email to all of you. Six people called me on Tuesday in support of the fields um, and really liking the idea of it being a multi-use field. Um, and there's two concerns that I ended up talking to people a little bit about. One, one concern was that perhaps it would be all for football. And I, that's not the case. We all know that. Um, so I reassured them and also told them to take the survey. Um, another concern I had was where does the runoff go? Will that be going in the river? I mean, can, do we know when it comes to the fields, <coughs> when it rains, or how that's drained? I mean, yeah. that would be something secret. The answer would that. That's part yeah. of the secret would answer, absolutely. Um, and I'm just thinking currently. I'm going through in my head what um, our CWC project just addressed, and it was not the runoff from that field in particular. Um, but the seeker would give us the answer to that. Okay. Absolutely, right, James. And I also have that concern too, more, and I've got to mention it about um, the runoff and what would it do to our water system, uh, and also the survey. The, um, many, most people I spoke, well, all, everybody I spoke to said. They did not do, fill out the survey. They felt it was didn't serve any purpose because um, it was just too vague. Okay. So the survey is fluid. So, um, and I'm just looking for feedback from this board. If I'm hearing that we should, in, you know, add additional questions to the survey. Put a different survey out if we're in a different part in the planning process. Um, that's certainly something we could consider. I also don't want to lose track of the comment that James made on um, where we sit with the scope. Do we feel positioned to move forward on the scope as it was presented? Are you looking for another meeting, a special meeting prior to that? Um, I don't want to just move on with kind of these dangling pieces there if we're not landing them. So I need direction on that. Is there any way to get a cost, a rough cost of developing up in the elementary? Um, we could. How would that affect our current decision making? What are you thinking? Well, would it be wise to allocate X amount of dollars from each thing we do moving forward? You're going to have a plenty of plan to ahead. It's got to be done incrementally. It can't just be on one project. So, um, I don't see how any of that could feasibly be done in the current project because of where we rest with incidentals. We're so close on incidentals as they are. Um, but we could see how close those numbers are that that Lucy had heard for future planning. Um, I would just caution us to know that I don't see how that would move us forward in the current project to keep us on the same timeline that we're on. But we could certainly seek those numbers. And I think the time that it would take us to get those numbers is probably a little longer. We could get ballpark, we could get ballpark ideas though, just to inform our long-term planning. Um, I think that that's feasible and that's a good idea. Just we could even run those by fiscal and just say, in order to achieve this, 
How many years would it take? <coughs> what are we looking at with incidentals? What would be your recommendation? I think you brought up a point earlier that um, could run in a parallel track, and that is what would be the sequencing, kind of as you're saying, for and what would that look like, those steps getting into the longer term. But I, I agree that it wouldn't be, it doesn't really impact this particular project that you just pointed out. I think it would be good information to have, and when the question comes up that you had about what is the timing of addressing all of the concerns, then we have, there is a plan in place that you could say, well, okay, the next project that happens four years from now or whatever that's, we're gonna take this piece. Mm -hmm. that, that, that helps that question. Right. I'm not sure, I'm thinking, if we're going to approve this scope on May 22nd, and we rep and as we all know, we represent our community, not our own thoughts. And I have definitely voted sometimes against my own thoughts uh, because I thought the community was for this, for different items. Um, somehow I would like to get a, a better sense of what the community wants, and I'm not sure how to do it, and, and to be very honest, uh, whether it be to, I don't see us saying, okay, let's meet on a um, 14th, and then we'll, or 15th, I guess it would be some week ahead, and then we'll say, we'll approve it on the 22nd. I, I need more info uh, myself uh, before I, I realize uh, it, 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 it's kind of, uh, maybe people just uh, speak to us individually on how we think we're going to respond. I'm not sure, or whether uh, certain people are open for different ideas. Uh, I just want to say that when it came to the um, questionnaire, uh, that I don't think that parents or anyone received that. It just ended up on our website and was posted through Facebook, but I think like... It went out, it went out through email yeah. in a couple of my monthly updates. Recently? I, I, don't, I don't remember seeing it, but I believe you. I, we, can, I no, we can send it, we can certainly send it out again. Well, I, I don't think it would be profitable, from, at least from the people I spoke to, to send it out the same questionnaire without tweaking it. Right. Um, what they said is, Sure, I'm, I'm for enhancing the athletic uh, department and uh, skills for the, uh, our, our students in our uh, athletic department, but that doesn't mean I would like turf fields. That's what they said to me. Or well, I'm, for additional comments, right? Like they can, there, there's a section for additional comments. Yes. Well, so maybe concerns, but I, I think if it, that did go out again, probably rewording it, or maybe adding different questions could help. Not, the, not what's online, is something different? No, we're no, talking about the survey. Oh, yeah, yeah. Our survey? Like, is it asking questions that, I guess, we need to know the answer to to make a decision? Did you say that right? I think I'm also hearing concern that the way that the questions, now granted it was intended to be general coming out of the gate, right. because this has been around for a while, right? Mm -hmm. But now we know a little bit more where our community is thinking based on those that have shared their thoughts. And I'm also hearing that the way that the questions are designed at its inception are not tapping really what people want to say. And what people are wanting to say is how they feel about different parts of the project and how they want things to appear on the proposition. So rather than adding to the survey, maybe it's just another updated one based on the feedback we have so far. Tyler, I know you're waiting to chat. Yeah, so, <clears throat> Mrs. Kelly, from what I've heard from the students is that the things that we want is a solution. And I agree, you know, 100%. If we can establish and set this district on a 20 year track to solve this issue, that is what we should do, but also 
you know, students even in the elementary school won't get that benefit in 20 years because what we have right now, and I credit Mrs. Shepard for how you phrased it at the public um, hearing, is that it is an issue and what we need is a solution. And that's the frustration that a lot of students are showing is that, like, the turf, as we see it, obviously, like, it doesn't solve baseball and it doesn't solve all scheduling conflicts, but it is the best solution that we have. And I agree that if we can devote future projects to creating athletic fields that more people are interested in, it seems like a better way to serve the district, we should absolutely do that and establish those projects. But for right now, from what students are voicing and from what I've heard from the vast majority, basically all of the students that I've talked to, is that the turf field and re you know, vamping Dave Kelly Field is the solution that we see. And that's how we see fixing the issue in a more, obviously it would still take a couple of years, but it's a more immediate solution than trying to wait out this issue 20 years, I guess, if that makes sense. And I completely understand is that like we need information, we need to know what people are thinking and what exactly issue the issue is that we want to see fixed. But to me and Carter, the issue is pretty clear and it's been voiced pretty simply to us is that this is an issue, the lack of, or I guess using the Legion fields all the time and not being able to play at Dave Kelly Field is the issue that we're having. And the turf field is the solution that students have been voicing support for, I guess. It's, that's what Carter and I have been hearing overwhelmingly, is that it's an issue and that the best solution you see to immediately remedy, is, uh, remedy that is the turf field. And if that means we have one turf field moving forward that we could host you know, sectional games at or events like that, that they're looking for host districts that require turf fields, so football playoffs, stuff like that, and then we could have those fields 20 plus years in the future, I think that's a good thing. But right now it's an issue and it's a problem. And I think turf field is how students see that being solved, I guess. It's just what Carter and I have heard to try to, I guess, answer your question some about what people are seeing. Maybe Kelly, you could explain um, a little more specifically like what you mean by approving the soap. <clears throat> um, what it does and doesn't mean. Sure, sure. Um, again, as I mentioned before, the scope remains somewhat fluid, but it does allow us to move forward with all of our applications to the state. So this, the scope has not changed from what we presented to the community. Um, however, once we move toward both, particularly after things are approved and we go out to bid and actual real costs come in, then we are as we lead up to that, we're identifying priority items within the scope. And if circumstances change so that certain things cannot be addressed, what are we identifying as priority items? What are we identifying as priority two items? What might we identify as bid alternates? We have not done that work yet. But that work also does not necessarily have to be delineated prior to approving this preliminary scope to be able to move forward. That's all that we're asking for at the main meeting. Um, that being said, one of the other items under new business tonight is to approve uh, Schoolhouse Construction as our construction manager. Now that we've addressed the concerns that existed you know, within, uh, within the contract. And once we have them under contract and on board, then those are the professionals that we'll be able to lean on to help provide greater advice as to approaches to the proposition next steps in prioritizing things within the scope. Um, so if you feel it might be worthwhile once we have them under contract to still meet prior to the 22nd so that you feel more confident casting that vote, we could that's certainly an option as well. Um, I just need to know what you need. I don't need anything. I'm ready to move forward. How about yourself? I'm ready to move forward. How do you spend, I mean, how long in looking at the scope of our architects? And that was informed by all their research and review, facility plans. So, you know, I think it's been pretty well vetted. Uh, I'm okay with it. I mean, at our last meeting, Kelly asked. A few times, are you all okay with this? If anyone isn't, speak up now. And she paused and she waited. Um, and I thought that was our time to kind of express any, you know, 
concerns to bring into this meeting. Um, so I'm okay with it. I don't know. That's not really my role to do this, so I'm just trying to move the meeting along here. I perfectly, <laughs> and that's why I asked for the definition of stolen vision, what it is that we would be covering, because I think um, that makes it a little easier to understand what it is that we'd be doing on the 22nd. Um, from my perspective, I'm, I'm good with, with that, um, with the date of the 22nd. And the scope. I will definitely go along with what the board uh, had decides. Um, however, I don't want to be blindsided like we had in the past. Uh, not this building project, but the one before that. Um, I'm not reading what the community feels, and and I don't know how we really can take that pulse. And I'm not sure the pulse is this way or that way, and I would like to get a better barometer, I guess. But we'll see, if they don't come to the meetings, they don't come to the um, meeting we had, I was surprised at how few people were at that meeting last week. I was, there. I didn't think there were that many people there. I really didn't. And I think, so people have, have to take the survey, people have to come to the meetings. I don't know how else, how, how, do, how do you reach everybody? The people that are, I mean, a lot of the people that are opposed to things are the ones that are the most vocal. I don't think we're hearing from everybody. I don't know how you possibly could hear from everybody. I don't either, um, Kim, but I do know that uh, the capital project that did go down, uh, they were, uh, Sue Temple was running to get more uh, ballots made out because, what was it, like 500 people? There was an, uh, the most number we've ever had. Nobody anticipated it, and I don't want that to happen again. I don't want to even get close to that. And so I'm not saying it's going to go this way or that way. I just want to get a better sense of what the community is saying. A good voter is an informed voter, and it has um, not in this district. I wasn't here for the planning of the prior project, but in my former district, I was intimately involved. And following uh, an approved scope, we, we went on a road show. And we went to meetings where we were invited at fire halls. We went and sat in businesses. We you know, kind of just went out and really tried to provide information, answer questions as best as possible, to address just questions and concerns that will continue to come out right up until October. Um, and I have every intention to engage with our community not just expect our community to come up here, but to actually get out. Um, we have our farmer's market in the summer, where <coughs> since it originated in COVID, where we had a DEA tent to answer questions about COVID, I see another opportunity now um, to be there to answer questions related to this project. Uh, just to get information out in response to questions. And that, in turn, will help us, I think, get a better pulse on um, you know, where it will help to inform our decisions related to the propositions, how they will appear, um, but also to get our finger on the pulse of are we on the right track here or not. Um, will that happen prior to our meeting next month? No, but I'm not certain it's it's necessarily critical to be able to approve a, you know, the, the general uh, scope. Um, <coughs> I had a bullet. Need to be able to, <laughs> I hear what you're saying. Brainstorm solutions to that to avoid a similar outcome. Well, I think I think. Sorry, I'm sorry. What's that? I said avoid turf. I don't think that's what she's talking about. I think she's talking about informing people 
I don't care how people vote. I could, I could care less. It's their right to vote however they want to vote. I just, I just pe people need to be informed. Pe that's all they need to. I mean, this whole thing came about at the beginning of the year with our superintendent and our business administrator <laughs> talking about the capital project, and it's their job to bring the needs to us. They bring the needs. Like I mean, I said this one other time. We, I don't work here every day. I have another job. I don't know if the sidewalk needs to be replaced or drainage needs to go underground somewhere. I don't know the needs, all the needs for a capital project in this district. It's their job to bring that to us. They did. One of the needs was the fields are in poor shape that we don't own. We need to replace them or fix them or whatever at taxpayer expense. So it's, this is this was brought up by a need in, in a solution, just like paving or anything else. So I think they just need to be informed what it is and then let them vote how they want to vote. That's their right to do. I just think we need to inform them what it is. I, I think a lot of people are don't understand what it is. <laughs> I don't, I just don't think they do. I do think we made some uh, progress in, in from informing people mm -hmm. that, um, and that's, I think, balanced the folks that I've talked to, some very much um, was, you know, pro uh, fields and turf and all that. Some, um, yeah, you know, a lot of questions, some information seeking, but there's also this group in the middle that's kind of back and forth based on the information you're talking about. And it's interesting, there's been a number of people that have been, um, one, um, I, I think a lot of people appreciate hearing what you had to say, Tyler, at the last meeting, uh, because I think the student perspective um, was something we didn't hear and appreciate fully, and I think they did a great job of articulating that. I think that's something you have to keep in mind and it has to be in the forefront of our decision making. But also, I think the process that we've gone down so far with this, and the various ways we've given information, and Kelly is a part of any kind of run the process, has been improved to the point where people that are willing to hear and listen to facts have moved one way or another based on getting the information back to you. you know, people are going to vote on their own vote. We can't get some kind of litmus test that's going to say, you do this, you get 100% good to go. But I think the information and communication has been much better this time. So I think people that are in that decision making that are willing to hear points and make an educated decision are more informed one way or another than last time. But I think maybe some of the same things that you've already done in you know, another district by you know, doing meetings at different halls or whatever, you know, I think that's I think that's a good idea. It's a great idea. I mean, if people don't come, they don't come. I don't know what you can do about that. <laughs> I think there's also an element that's a little bit of a vulnerability, and that's with misinformation, and that's why I didn't mean to jump on the 8 or 10 million, but it was also said at the public forum, well, this has been voted down twice. I'm not sure I remember two times. Maybe someone else does. No, no, you're right. It was said twice. And, and so actually said it. And, and yes. the next person so, like, said it, and we got it. And we may also, yeah, that's I why agree. I'm hesitant yeah. about these yeah. things that get put out or said in a microphone. And all of a sudden, someone writes it down, or we get an email, and it, it got adopted as fact. It really is not. So to clarify, it has been the athletic fields have been voted down once. Correct. Yes. Okay. I already showed seven to one. Yeah. Right. Right. Pretty fairly significant. And then that caused that to go up for a revote with the removal of that piece. And then the project passed on the second vote. So there were two votes, only one with which included the athletic fields. So Along those lines, if we do have any community members that either you're speaking with or maybe that are watching tonight that have questions about what they're reading uh, through other people's interpretations and posts on social media or otherwise, please pick up the phone and call me directly. I've had many conversations 
Um, again, it's really hard to kind of talk about the line, not trying to convince people one way or the other, but to give factual information. Um, where do we land with John? And then, okay. So if I'm reading correctly, we're prepared to move forward with the scope, the scope as we know it on the meeting of the 22nd. Thank you. How many more uh, capital project forums do you have? I don't know yet. Okay. Um, if we're looking at October, it's going to depend on really the feedback from the board uh, and helping me to navigate this along with our construction managers. Um, minimally another one you know, prior to October, possibly two. That just depends on what we feel we need. I think getting out of the community and engaging that capacity is going to be really helpful. Mm -hmm. And once we have a schedule for that, I will let all of you know when and where, and board members are more than welcome to join me, so long as we don't have a quorum, um, but more than welcome. For farmers markets, right? Farmers market? markets minimally, yes. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, any other questions or comments? Ask for a motion, please, to approve the proposed Delaware Shenango Madison Atsego BOCES administrative budget for the 2023-2020 school year in the amount of two million eight hundred thirty-six thousand thirty-five dollars. So, in a second. Second. Thank you. Any questions or comments? And this is just the uh, administrative mm -hmm. portion of the budget. So I'm going to do a roll call. Yep, this is a roll call vote. Roll call vote. We're going to do this alphabetically with the presiding officer, last I think this is Newman. Uh, Trustee Haight? Yes. Trustee Kelly? Yes. Trustee Letty? Yes. Trustee Rava? Yes. Trustee Shepard? Yes. Trustee Tucker? Yes. And tr Trustee Newman? Yes. Okay. Um, continuing on our BCN Lobosi's theme, we have their Board of Election candidates. And I'll ask for a motion, please to cast one vote for the following candidates. Um, Yvonne Laviola from Green Central School and Melissa Sepulveda <coughs> from Oxford Academy and Central School. Noting that there is a vacancy with the term remaining until June 2025. Yes, the promotion starts, is that what you said? Yes. yes. So, and a second? Second. Okay. Thank you. Any questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. The motion is carried. As Mr. Schultz had indicated uh, previously in his presentation, this is to approve the unit cost methodology for the 2023-2024 both these services. A motion, please, to approve the unit cost methodology submitted by DCM Obosis for the 2023-2024 school year. So moved. Lucy, thank you. And a second. Thank you. Any questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion is carried. And again, um, 
explained in Mr. Schultz's presentation. We have the DC and local seas transportation contracts. So a motion please to approve a transportation contract between the Delaware, Shenango, Madison, Otsego, Rosies, and Delaware Academy Central School District at Delhi for the period of September 6th, 2023 through June 30th, 2024, not to exceed the amount of $4,765. There's two contracts. Two contracts. Transportation and the school, each for the amount of $4,765. My apologies. So, thank you. And a second? Okay. Any questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Motion's carried. <clears throat> Make a motion, please, to adopt the budget for the 2023-2024 school year in the amount of $21,547,548 to be put before voters on Tuesday, May 16th, 2023, for current obligations or so much thereof as may be necessary shall be raised by the levy of a tax upon the taxable property of said district and collected in annual installments as provided by Section 416 of the Education Law, and in anticipation of such tax obligations of said school district would be issued. So, Lauren, thank you. And second? Thank you. Any questions or comments? And this is a roll call vote. Trustee Lee? Yes. Trustee Kelly? Yes. Trustee Lenny? Yes. Trustee Rabba? Yes. Trustee Sherman? <laughs> yes. Trustee Tucker? Yes. And Trustee Newman? Yes. Okay, I'm going to go through a bit here so the history is they know. Whereas at a regular meeting of the Board of Education held on Monday, January 30th, 2023, the board was given presentations from three companies for a request for proposal for construction management services with respect to upcoming capital project. Whereas the Board of Education has reviewed each request for proposal. Whereas a mutual agreement has been reached between the Board of Education and Schoolhouse Construction Services, LLC. Therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Education of the Delaware Academy Central School District at Delhi hereby approves a contract with Schoolhouse Construction Services, LLC, to provide construction management services to Delaware Academy Central School District at Delhi for a period April 25th, 2023 through June 2027 in the amount of 3.96% based on the approved referendum not to exceed 555,000 based on a $14 million project. As decided by the superintendent of the Board of Education, authorized payment thereunder and authorizes superintendent Kelly M. Zimmerman to execute said contract on behalf of the school district. A motion, please. Lauren, thank you. And a second? Second. Lucy, thank you. And again, we have a roll call vote. Trustee Haight? Yes. Trustee Kelly? Yes. Trustee Letty? Yes. Trustee Rama? Yes. Trustee Shepard? Yes. Trustee Tucker? Yes. And Trustee Newman? Yes. Again, I'm going to give a bit of history with the resolution regarding the A.L. Kellogg RFP. 
Whereas the Board of Education is seeking fiscal management of the A.L. Kellogg Fund, and whereas on October 20th, 2022, the Finance Committee, a subcommittee of the Board of Education, met and briefly discussed the A.L. Kellogg request for proposal, and whereas on November 14th, 2022, the Board of Education heard a presentation from BKS Partners, a third-party investment advisory firm, who presented an analysis of proposals from three investment firms, offered recommendation, and responded to questions from the board members. And whereas on January 19th, 2023, the Finance Committee, a subcommittee of the Board of Education, met regarding inviting two firms to present to the board. And whereas on June, January 30th, 2023, at a regular meeting of the Board of Education, the members of the Finance Committee reported that during their January 2023 meeting, they received an update on the AL Kellogg numbers as well as the AL Kellogg RFP. And whereas on February 27, 2023, at a regular meeting of the Board of Education, the Board received presentations from two firms, KeyBank and One Digital, for a request for a proposal on the fiscal management of the AL Kellogg funds and directed the Finance Committee to re-review the recommendations of BK, BKS partners and explore outstanding questions. And whereas on March 16, 2023, the Finance Committee, a subcommittee of the Board of Education, met and held a Zoom meeting with BKS partners to re-review proposals and to seek additional clarification and advisement from BKS partners regarding the free structures of each RFP. Whereas the Board of Education has reviewed each request for proposal, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Education awards a contract to perform fiscal management services to Delaware Academy Central School District at Delhi to One Digital. And I'll take a motion for that. So moved. And a second. Second. And thank you. Any questions or comments? I have a, I have a question. <clears throat> Um, I'm kind of surprised that the, the, the name that you said at the end. Um, and maybe I missed something. <coughs> but I was up to speed to the last whereas um, finance committee meeting from last month. Um, right after the presentations, I thought we talked about the other firm. I thought we all were going in that direction. So, what? Um, I'm lost here. Yeah. So I think Carrie presented the. Uh, <coughs> here, can I take a motion to go into executive session? Yeah. So just as a matter of a contract. Oh yeah. Yeah. So. Is that a second? Second. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Here, can you join us? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's not Thank you. 
Okay, so yeah. It was epic. It was such a big
Should the district experience a need for an emergency closure that requires the use of an emergency day, they may be rescinded as needed at the discretion of the superintendent. Any motion, please? Motion. Thank you. And second? Second. Thank you. Any questions or comments? We're reluctant to say anything about this because you know what happens. <laughs> so please don't even put that out there. <laughs> Tuesday would come back first. All in favor? Uh, aye. aye. Any opposed? Any motion is carried. And a motion, please, to adopt the revised 2023-2024 academic calendar as submitted, <coughs> submitted and amended. For this is for next school year. We had omitted designating um, an additional holiday as a day that the district is closed. Um, it's still we um, resolved this in all of the collective bargaining agreements. But we are, this is just indicating another day where the district is closed over the Christmas holiday. It was with the addition of Juneteenth, the fact that it's a leap year, a number of factors. And when we originally approved it, we just neglected to do that. So that's all that this is about. Thank you for clarifying that, because that was my question. What's yes. different? <laughs> yes. Motion? Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, the motion is carried. And we will go back to public comments. Please note the Board of Education welcomes comments and questions during this session, but they will not respond to these comments or questions at this time. Items or issues you wish the Board to consider for action or discussion may be placed on the Board agenda by contacting the District Clerk or Superintendent one week prior to the Board meeting. Do you have any public comments? Thank you. Oh. Can you state your name and address for the record? And you'll just need to speak up enough so that these microphones can capture you up here. Uh, I just wanted to talk real quick on the public um, or the comments you guys have on the capital project. I like to see the, the colorful conversation and kind of the essence of the board, right? Is that you know, disagree and come to a, a good opinion about where we go. But I did, I was in construction management for about 10 years, and I will echo how important it is, as Mr. Zimmerman said, to stay on these days for these these votes. We always joke that one day in pre-construction was 10 to 30 days in construction. And when that started happening, the costs were just like triple for no reason. I never really could understand it. Um, I think we're way too far down the road to start talking about huge soul change. You know, maybe a year ago, if we wanted to have this heated debate about the turf or not the turf, I think we're way too far down the road um, to start taking out big pieces of scope because I think at this point it's impossible to add in an equal size scope um, to that project. And if we delete scope, and we don't get anything back in, and you guys have um, found a way to put a $14 million project together at zero additional cost to the taxpayer, I think we would definitely be selling the district short um, with the funds, especially with the aid that we're getting from the state, but 73%. Um, so I think my opinion, and this is why I said this, my opinion to this whole thing is, to take it out, I don't think it's smart just because we're not gonna get anything of that equal size go back in. But if we do separate it on the ballot, it would give the taxpayer still a choice to say yes or no. Um, to put a, a, a survey out at this point, I think is maybe not feasible because the only thing you're going to accomplish is to say, well, the people that responded said no, so we're going to take out the scope and then move down on these funds um, from the state. Because I don't think we can put any size scope back in in the time frame we're looking at. So that's just my two cents. Um, I appreciate everything you guys are doing. And hopefully, see you next month. Mr. <laughs> Shepard, no? Okay, other discussion? We will take your comments at this time. Um, let's start with Mrs. Kelly today. 
Um, I would like to reiterate uh, what um, Mrs. Uh, or Crystal mentioned uh, about Mr. Wake. He's going to be a hard person to uh, replace. Uh, he, he's uh, an icon, really, of, of, of the phys ed department and, and it, uh, a gentle giant, just a nice guy. Um, I would uh, stress that I would like everybody to uh, come out uh, for our budget vote. I think uh, lots, lots of work has been put on it. Um, and I, I hope that you will see that we have tried to trim it and that it is uh, one of the lowest, if not the lowest, in our area and will still give us what uh, we strive for for our students. And we just had a, a tournament on Sunday and overwhelmingly every, all the contestants commented what a lovely facility we had, what a beautiful facility. They were awed <coughs> by it and how um, each project has kept the integrity of what uh, we try to preserve at Delaware Academy. Um, and I have to mention that all the students deported themselves in an excellent manner. So I was very pleased to be part of it. Great, thank you. Mr. Tucker? Um, yeah, unfortunately, I'm probably gonna go a little dark here, but uh, it's kind of, uh, at last month's meeting, Lauren O'Leary spoke about how her daughter was called slanderous names on the bus for being Jewish. The same thing happened at, for, with my nephew at a different school district. Almost verbatim, same words. And um, so I've done a little looking and um, anti-Semitism is up 30% year over year, according to the Anti-Defamation League. Um, and I find it very concerning that these kids, I mean, any kid shouldn't have to be bullied, but it's, it's very, it hit home when it happened to my nephew. And um, I, I don't know if we have time this year, if it's something we could do to do some kind of presentation to the kids to let them know um, how wrong this is. Just, this way of thinking. We, I don't know. I know you. I know yeah, there's no, things done. Many, many, many. Yes. And it's, this, yeah, this our just whole year when, has been um, devoted to this. My sister-in-law called, and she was mm -hmm. on a Zoom call with my wife, and uh, I, was, like, I was stunned. I'm like, this, this could have been the same letter. I'm like, in a totally different school district, same age group. So there you go. Something really bad going on. That's, you know, we need to be really aware of. I appreciate That's you bringing it. that up, James. Uh, my children who are half Jewish have both received uh, through Snapchat swastikas and um, death threats or jokes, and it's started as young as like third grade. So it's, it's, it's alive and well. It's very scary. So thank you. We have a collective responsibility as a society, as families, and certainly as schools to address these issues. Um, that has been a focus of our board this year. You established a building, a, a loose board goal, district goal surrounding that. Um, and the anti bullying, both cyber bullying and otherwise, has been the focus of many of our professional developments for staff, certainly our speaker series that was sponsored by A.L. Kellogg, um, and a lot of the conversation that Ms. Trask mentioned is being targeted uh, with our sustained um, development and um, uh, those roundtable interventions targeting our middle school. That's happening again next week. So, um, you know, every, this hits home for a lot of people in a lot of different ways. Uh, so I, it's interesting, uh, one of my grandchildren mentioned, you know, mom, oh, grandma, uh, it's not, uh, bullying is not what you see in the movies. He said, uh, it is not the pushing or the fighting or the punching in the nose, it's the words. Yeah, 
the words that uh, are the, the bullying parts. And another person mentioned to me that, and I, prob I agreed with the person, that probably 90% of the bullying happens when there aren't any, there isn't supervision, direct supervision. It happens on the bus or at recess or at lunch. And I don't, you know, and, and that's where we also have to be vigilant. And uh, absolutely. When we were growing up, uh, there was oh, an African American and our uh, one of our peers in school, and was called to the N word over and over and again. I mean, he was physically assaulted, um, but one day he decided to bring a gun to the school. And you and pulled it on who was beating him up and calling the M N word like right in front of Prestos. Um, they both got suspended for three days. I don't. I mean, that's just something that I remember um, the retaliation that can happen from being bullied is real. Uh, it's it's scary. We want to keep our kids safe. We are addressing it head on. If you take a walk through our middle school corridors, the students um, recently completed a whole poster presentation on bullying and cyberbullying. Um, and some of the, I, I stopped to read some of them the other day, and the insight that our students have um, along the lines of what you were pointing out is, is poignant. But also, thank you specifically for you know continuing to sponsor student activities like ukulele club, ukfest. I four of my very good friends all went, and they rave about it still. I know Rose is devastated; she can't go, so they appreciate your support. Same thing with our cross country team; they're an incredible program. So just your continuing to support and sponsor their activities means a lot to the students, and it makes us feel seen and heard. So again, just thank you guys, and thank you for letting us be here to voice our opinions and how we feel about things. It really does mean a lot, and I think. Like Mr. Hate said, it has made a difference this time around because I know that the word I've heard a lot about the second time at the turf has been transparency, which I think has made a lot of difference. So I think we just have to continue to keep that in mind as we move forward. Can we redshirt you? <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> you are going to run for the board at some point, correct? Yes. So well spoken. That's a shepherd. No comment. Thank you. Mr. Hate. Yeah, I want to echo those congratulations to John Hay, um, after 39 years. And I, I remember him when he started. I think he was in the, uh, he did ISS when he used to have that. <laughs> oh, she was. <laughs> that was uh, his, he was down one of these halls, and he had those double doors, and he was uh, head, hand, head in hand the whole day. And, um, he sat by her. Um, I want to say um, thank you to Carrie for uh, presenting the numbers the way that you have here. They're so clear. Give us a great snapshot. We'll ask you again in a month. But, uh, <laughs> no, but this just helps remind you. Know, you're living this every day, and it really helps keep us uh, informed. It's a, it's a great representation, really easy to read it. Um, so, so thanks for that. And then, um, highlight of my night was at Ukulele Club. We could just play for another two hours, <laughs> sat, had a wonderful meeting. It was a good meeting, so 
Um, I appreciate seeing everything that the students do on this tour. That's it. Ms. I just want to um, recognize that we've got um, five people running for two seats this election, and I'm appreciative to everybody who is running. Four of them are in this room. Um, it's a very honorable thing to do. Uh, and I uh, particularly want to thank James and Kim for your service. Um, it's been an honor to be on the board with both of you. Um, I appreciated all of your perspectives and efforts and insights, um, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I too will extend my congratulations to Mr. Woody on making that tough decision to retire. <laughs> Again. <laughs> Again. <laughs> he, does leave a, he does leave a legacy, that's for sure. Um, both my kids wrestled, and whenever I think of Mr. Wake, all I can think of is over <laughs> That was classic. So, we'll remind everybody of our upcoming Board of Education meeting dates. Our budget hearing is Monday, May 8th at 7 p.m. in the high school auditorium. A Meet the Candidates Forum, hosted by the Speech and Debate Club, will be held from 6 to 7, just prior to the budget hearing. We hope you will join us to meet the candidates, Nathaniel McCarthy, Sean Secord, Ro Avila, Kimberly Shepard, and James Tucker, Jr. Our annual budget vote and Board of Education election is Tuesday, May 16th, 2022, in-person voting in the middle school building, first floor, between the gym and the agricultural classroom from noon to 8. Signs will be posted to guide the public to the voting location. Is there a chicken dinner? Yes. Yes. Okay, Girls so basketball. Put a plug in. Um, yes. We've usually got a, a dinner fundraiser going that night. It sounds like we are having one. Break the same only. Yeah, you can sell us out, so if you can get tickets to yeah. Come early. Get your chicken. Our regular Board of Education meeting is Monday, May 22nd in the High School Media Library Center at 5 p.m. It is anticipated that the Board will convene an executive session at 5 p.m. and return to open session at 6 p.m. The deadline for items to be placed on the Board agenda is the Tuesday prior to each Board of Education meeting. If you have any questions, please contact the District Clerk at 607 746-1306. Then I will take a motion, please, to enter into executive session to discuss matters regarding personnel and the terms of the contract with the district with no action to be taken. So moved. Thank you and a second. Second. Thank you. 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 Thank you.